Welcome to the Humble Hoof Podcast. My name is Alicia Harlov. This is a podcast for both horse owners and hoof care professionals, offering discussions into various philosophies on the health of the hoof and soundness of your horse. Please check us out on Facebook or at thehumblehoof.com. I have had a lot of people ask me about dealing with hoof injuries and what is considered a vet emergency or not. Now, I assume it's fairly clear that I am not a vet. I'm a hoof care provider, so I wanted to pull in someone qualified to cover this topic. My own personal large animal vet, Dr. Sarah Cook of Black Brook Veterinary Services based out of Hamilton, Massachusetts, has worked on many hoof injuries and lameness issues and graciously agreed to humor my questions for this episode. Sarah has worked in many places, from her time at Cornell as a student to working in Georgia, Nicaragua, and now co-owning a practice in New England, and I've been increasingly impressed with her knowledge and skills and approach to large animal medicine. Just a side note, we were sitting and chatting in my living room to record this episode, which means you may hear my dog begging for attention or some cars outside, but I think it adds a nice ambiance. We jump right in here with questions about puncture wounds to the foot. Okay, so you're obviously a general practice vet, you're my own personal vet, so you see a lot of different things in the field. So how typical would you say are emergency calls related to hoof issues or injuries in your practice? Yeah, it's something we see all the time. Definitely one of our top three most common emergency questions or calls has to do with the foot, either a you know, stepped on a nail is the worst or potential abscess or just pulled a shoe and stepped on the clip and what do I do? I mean, all the time. We deal with it all the time. So yeah, I would say sometimes we can deal with it over the phone or with a picture. I would say the majority of hoof problems, if the horse is really lame, we end up going to see. So that's the biggest factor. Like, is the horse really lame? And if the answer is yes, we usually don't uh, wait on those. Yeah. And so you actually mentioned a horse stepping on a clip, which I don't deal with a lot because I don't work with metal. But is that something where you always want to go see the horse if they've stepped on a clip and it's in their foot? Yeah, not necessarily. The nice thing about clips is that you know how big they are and they really don't go that deep. So stepping on a clip, you know, like I said, it's a round piece of metal. It can go in fairly deep, but it's not going to go in deep enough to cause really life-threatening problems. So a lot of times the owner, if they can remove the shoe, soak and poultice that foot. But I would say that's one of the times where I can sometimes avoid an, an emergency fee for the owner. But I'm always happy to look if they're worried. One of my pieces of advice is have a tool available to remove a shoe if it is crooked or the horse is stepping on the clip. Or even just if the nails have shifted, that can be a a problem too. And that can cause an abscess later down the line if the shoe is just twisted, even if it's not a clipped shoe. Yeah, and obviously one of my worst nightmares, especially having a barefoot horse, was finding my horse at the barn with a nail in its foot. And that was in 2015 and I was boarding with a vet tech friend who, you know, stopped me from pulling it out and had me call the vet right away. But can you talk a little bit about your approach to a nail puncture in a foot? Yeah, any kind of penetrating injury to the foot, I would say almost always with maybe the possible session of a clip is a is an emergency because you don't always know how deep they go or exactly where they go. So the first piece of advice is, you know, if you do find a wire, nail, screw, anything, even a really sharp rock, to be honest, call your vet. If they're close, don't pull it out. If it's a nail, you think that horse is in danger of pushing it further in. There's a trick you can do, which is to like duct tape a block of wood to the foot. And then the horse can put some weight on it without driving the metal object deeper in. So if you can avoid pulling it out, that's helpful because they're rarely straight and they often curve in in directions you don't expect. And to be able to take an x-ray with the object in there can often just rule out a lot of really bad stuff. So if you know for sure where it's going and you know that it's a avoiding a lot of critical structures, then everyone can take a deep breath and and feel better about it. And conversely, if you can prove that it is going straight towards the navicular bursa, that might be a horse that, you know, you would end up referring for a, you know, surgical debridement sooner rather than later. So it can really help guide decision making in both directions. Yeah. And I didn't really think about it bending because, you know, I usually think, okay, if I see the nail in front of like the front half of the foot, I'm probably a little more worried than if I see it in the back half. 
but obviously like you said it could bend or shift yeah, it's interesting you said that. I actually feel like it's almost the opposite. When I see objects puncturing the foot from like the tip of the frog forward towards the toe, I, I feel better. So that part, it's not that it can't cause trouble, it can, but really the, the most life-threatening, you know, part to puncture or to have infected is really you know either the deep flexor tendon and the navicular bursa or god forbid the navicular bone that's really hard to deal with and it causes so much pain that the horse is just super super lame and that in itself then you're you know even assuming you can control the initial problem you can run into problems with support limb laminitis and things like that so if I see a um, nail and it's either towards around the point of the frog or, f or f in front of that, the problems I see typically have to do with the fact that the corium is usually, you know, infected or at least exposed. And uh, infected corium is basically a subsolar abscess. And so, you know, that, that is something we deal with usually by just providing drainage down distally away from the coffin bone and making sure that we soak and protect that foot until it has hardened and, and regrown a functional sole again. Sometimes you get the corium, once it's, it's exposed, can kind of start to prolapse out through the sole, which is a super painful condition. And it looks just like a little pink button. And it's normal corium, but once it kind of protrudes through the, the solar surface, that can be very frustrating because of the amount of pain it causes the horse. It almost like gets pinched off by the sole. So that's something that usually a vet does need to deal with. And typically we can like debride it and put a bandage on it. We use pressure sometimes right on it to keep it back. And sometimes if it's that painful, you also need to relieve pressure on certain areas. So usually protruding corium is something that a, a vet can probably best help you with. But obviously other things, so we're talking about injuries here, penetrating injuries to the toe area. And the other thing that can happen is if it does get all the way to the coffin bone, you can either have osteomyelitis, so that's an infection of the coffin bone. Um, and if that is not controlled, what usually forms is a sequestrum, so a small piece of dead bone. And that is something that does, you know, eventually need surgical intervention. You go in and you basically curette the dead bone. So that is something that eventually could require some pretty significant intervention, but it's not typically something that you end up losing the horse over. It's so it's, yes, it's concerning, but it's not as concerning as a puncture wound to the back half for the foot and so we can go into that now like if you did um, the worst case scenario basically I just had it the other day a nail it's actually a screw and a polo pony and and the tract of the screw I unfortunately didn't have the benefit of an x-ray but by the time I got to the horse the draining tract was fairly well established and so I was able to numb the foot block the foot and I just gently introduced a metal probe into the draining tract and and that probe went straight to the navicular bone and that's really the worst case scenario. Those are the hardest and that, there's a few reasons for that. One is that, you know, getting drainage in that area is hard. There's a lot of structures. Um, it's not easily drained. You obviously can't just like hack through the deep flexor tendon to get drainage because that will be <laughs> another problem. And then, you know, similar to that, there's often some damage to the deep flexor tendon with those types of injuries. So a tear there, and we all know how painful those can be. Even if it's not a complete tear, a, a damage to the deep flexor tendon there can cause a lot of pain. So... Those are the ones that, you know, we typically as a practice refer to a surgeon. The horse gets put under general anesthesia and as best as the surgeon is able to establish drainage, they do that. They can flush the navicular bursa. They can debride any like pieces of, you know, the flexor tendon that are loose. So they can do bursoscopy also and they can, there's a scope small enough to fit in the navicular bursa. There's all these things that can be done if you, you know, unfortunately have the bad luck to have a penetrating injury to the back half of the foot. But again, it comes back to knowing where it went. And so you can make those decisions quickly because obviously the quicker you intervene, the better outcome you're going to have. You know, the horse I saw the other day, like that horse had had the penetrating injury two weeks prior. And at that point, you know, there's really not a lot that I can do. I debrided and, you know, discussed the, the case with them, but it's really almost almost hopeless at that point in time. So um, it's very, very frustrating to be dealing with that after the fact you know, if it can be avoided. So yeah. try to take an x-ray with the object in the foot. Unfortunately, if it's a stick, you can't. So that would be the exception. If there's a stick in the foot, uh, you're welcome to pull that out, <laughs> get rid of it. And the same things can happen. I've seen sharp sticks cause trouble, but you're not usually as much trouble as metal. Metal just tends to go much deeper than wood does. But I, I certainly have seen, you know, 
wood splinters in the flexor tendons, for example, those are very, very frustrating because you can't x-ray them to see them. They're even hard to see on the ultrasound. Yeah. So if there's like a best case scenario, for example, Vinny Mygelding, his, I don't know how it happened, but the nail went like two inches straight into his digital cushion, which yeah. luckily didn't really affect much else. But, you know, say there's a best case scenario, it didn't affect any synovial structures. Mm -hmm. What would the owner do at home and how long should it take? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I don't mind. When I see nails going into the digital cushion, I take a sigh of relief because those often, I would say, just because the the connective tissue, so the, the digital cushion, I'm sure most of you know, but it's mostly fat and some elastic connective tissue. There's not that much really dense connective tissue in that area. So I think what happens is even if an abscess forms, it has a little bit less resistance and it tends to just bust out the corner band at the heel. And you can have sometimes quite a large defect there, you know, in terms of they look just like, it looks just like a slit. It's nothing dramatic. But for some reason, just with the pressures involved and the strength of the tissue, I find that those break out and drain easier than other locations. So yeah, so I guess it's sort of a caveat to say, yes, the back half of the foot is worse, except if it's to the side and it just goes into the digital cushion, I think that's actually preferable. Yeah. yeah, it's the ones that, you know, it looks like it's to the side, but the nail bends and then goes on midline that you really kind of has our blood pressure going up. Yeah. So. And so should we at that point be like soaking, wrapping, how long? Yeah. Um, I would say, you know, given, let's say, best case scenario, you have a nail, it goes into the digital cushion, your, your vet comes, takes an x-ray, says, yeah, I think you missed everything, you know, important, keep the horse at home. I would say, you know, probably three to five days of soaking, and obviously that foot needs to be kept protected and, you know, keep the manure out of, out of whatever wound is there. The interesting thing about a hoof wound is they close up so fast. I mean... Even a large penetrating wound to the sole a day or two later is hard to find. It's hard to find. It just, it, you know, the tissues have more elasticity, I think, than we give them credit for. And those holes close up fast, which is why then, you know, assuming there's bacteria and maybe debris left on the inside, they do tend to abscess so easily because the, the sole or even the, you know, frog or the heel closes up after it very quickly. Okay, awesome. So another question I get asked a lot, and I'm sure you get asked a lot, is, you know, a horse comes up suddenly severely lame, which I kind of call like broken leg lame because I don't really know what else to call it, describe it like a horse is three-legged lame. Should an owner ever assume that it's just an abscess or, you know, should they call the vet right away, treat it as an abscess for X amount of days or what do you yeah, That's recommend? such a good question. There's really basically only three reasons that a horse is that lame. So abscess a hoof abscess is one a septic joint is number two and number three is obviously a fracture so those are the three i'm you know i'm kind of oversimplifying a little bit there's maybe a few more <laughs> i would throw in a torn digital flexor tendon as a, another one but usually you can tell you know soft tissue injuries in the foot are another category but those three and and you know two of them i would say are obviously not okay to wait and the hoof abscess is okay to wait so you as a horse person a horse owner um you know can sort of try to work your skills to get better at trying to tell the signs of a hoof abscess so you know feeling that digital pulse that's something you should practice on your horse when they're not lame because even a normal horse you should be able to feel the pulse like at the back of the fetlock there where the blood vessels run over the sesamoid bones you should be able to feel your horse's heart rate there even when they're not lame and they don't have an abscess so getting your your fingers trained to find that pulse is really a great thing to have in your skill repertoire it's not easy it takes time but take your horse's heart rate just by putting your fingers on the back of their sesamoid bones there and then you'll get used to feeling what's normal for your horse and if you feel a real throbbing like a very strong pulsing that's a that's a great indicator that the problem is within the foot I would say take the horse's temperature as well you know having a fever or a, like a mild fever that could argue for either an abscess um, if you're getting a little cellulitis from the abscess or it could argue for a joint infection like I mentioned so you know having that information is there a digital pulse and what is the horse's temperature that can go a long way to helping you and your vet decide together whether it's something that gets seen right away or whether it's something that gets put in a soak and wrapped and and maybe reevaluated in the morning and I my advice would be like have a good relationship with your vet like we're all pretty uh we're all pretty good about we don't charge for th consults like that so you know it's like 
call, just call and talk it over. And even if you're thinking like, oh, my horse abscesses every spring in March when the ground is muddy and like, it's probably that, just talk to your vet, tell them what's going on and, you know, make a plan with your vet to say, maybe, you know, we give it 24 hours and if it's no better then I come see it or something like that, that would be my advice. I mean, yeah, abs, hoof abscesses, you know, they come in all flavors from like the most minor thing to the most annoying thing and, and everything in between. So it's hard to generalize about hoof abscesses and which ones are going to be a headache and which ones are going to go away in 48 hours. Having the information that will help your vet and then talking to your vet and making a decision is the best thing. Yeah. And if you've ruled that it is an abscess or even, a, you know, taken an x-ray and you can see that there's a pocket, but it hasn't resolved how long do you usually wait before you assume that it might be causing other issues or what other issues can that cause? Oh gosh, <laughs> that's probably an hour long discussion in itself. <laughs> so, you know, an, a, a frustrating hoof abscess, I think as you and I have, you know, seen together in some of your clients' horses, I mean, we've dealt with some that are weeks to months. The draft horse breeds are notorious for that. I think and not only is their hoof wall thicker, but they are more stoic as well. And you can have these really lingering, frustrating abscesses. So, you know, there's a few things we, we sort of use in our toolbox to try to decide when there's something more significant going on. And obviously x-rays are like one of the first things we do. Okay, is there sign of a you, you sometimes have to look really hard for a fracture of the coffin bone. They can hide on you. So taking multiple views of the foot and saying, oh, is this like just a really oblique wing fracture of P3 and not a heel abscess? So those are definitely the first thing we do. And then if that all looks okay, um, there's a blood test also that can sometimes be useful called a serum amyloid A. It's a marker basically of infection, um, in particular bacterial infection. So watching that, um, if it is elevated, you know, does it keep going up or does it is it coming down? That can help you find out if you're going in the right direction. Um, and occasionally, like <laughs> we had one this year, it, I think it was just an abscess, but it ended up going all the way to MRI because it was so frustrating. And that was a draft horse, you know, and they basically at the end of the MRI was inconclusive. And then the horse came home and busted the abscess out when it was home. <laughs> So it was like everyone was tearing their hair out and they can do that. You know, it doesn't matter how much training you have. Like it can happen that way that they just are very, very frustrating. And the horse can have sound days. And then three days later, you're like back where you started. So that's the extreme though. I would say that's very unusual. Um, something that only happens once in a blue moon that you have an abscess that frustrating. So to, to circle back to your original question, you know, an uncomplicated abscess, as I said before, like, you know, three to five days of soaking. And then you may need to protect the hoof longer than that. It's possible that you'll need to take special care for longer than that. But any lameness that's persisting, you know, significant lameness that's persisting more than five days, you certainly should be thinking about some more advanced diagnostics to rule out other problems yeah yeah and I think one more topic in terms of injury would be like a hoof wall avulsion is that the right word it is Where yeah a part of the hoof wall is like torn off if it's caught up in a fence or something and I've actually never worked on any case like that uh, and I don't even know that I would be well I'm assuming the vet would go out like I wouldn't be somebody that would go and, and do something in that case yeah, so these are kind of dramatic. They often bleed a lot. You know, obviously we all know how good the blood supply should be to a healthy hoof. So when it gets torn like that, it can be a very dramatic looking injury. But often these these cases do surprisingly well. So, you know, part of the hoof gets torn off. I would say most of the time it's towards the heel or one heel that gets torn off. There's a few reasons, you know, obviously the hoof wall is a little thinner back there, um, maybe a little weaker, and that's also sort of where it tends to catch if the horse, you know, kicks through, let's say they kick through a wooden, you know, stall wall, and then they yank their foot back through the hole. That's sort of where it tends to catch uh, a lot of the time. So avulsions, you know, assuming it's like a third or a quarter of the hoof, we often just treat those, you know, clean it up, get rid of any loose fragments, anything necrotic that's not going to survive. And then you just protect it and wait. And, you know, the corium will harden up. It'll regrow. The hoof will start to regrow down from the coronary band. And you usually end up with a bit of a, you know, a visible or palpable scar there but those often do really really well and if they do end up with a weakened area of hoof wall there's a number of you know great 
synthetic options you can do for like glue on shoes to distribute the weight and protect that area without having to drive nails because obviously that's you know a problem if you are a person who shoes your horses and you have an area of weakened wall it's not going to hold nails like you know compared to 20 years ago we just have so many great options for for keeping those horses going and shod and happy and sound so Avulsions are very dramatic, but often have less implications on the horse's long-term soundness than you might think. I think if they do, it, it often can be too that you have another soft tissue injury. So if you can imagine like getting a hoof caught and then yanked back, you could have a collateral tear of the coffin joint. You could have you know an, another soft tissue injury that may not be apparent. So often the bleeding thing that catches everyone's attention is actually not maybe the worst thing that happened. So yeah, definitely. I have seen pictures and they look really scary and I don't know what I would do if I came to a horse like that except tell them to call their vet yeah (laughs) yeah I mean in the in the acute stages it's usually right to call the vet and just get it bandaged sometimes hoof casts are used in those you know just a low cast that goes up um, covers just part of the pastern to really immobilize that foot and that helps just jump start you know good hoof growth the other thing that you know I'm sure most of you who are listening to this podcast have probably experienced is that an injured foot grows like crazy like if it has a good blood supply an injured foot will regrow faster than a normal foot will it's chronic crazy the difference like in even in one shoeing cycle i had a horse who i don't know what he stepped on he stepped on something sharp a rock a piece of metal um and he had a pretty deep wound to right at the tip of his frog and you know i i paired it out and and the corium was prolapsing a little bit and he was kind of painful but man, over one shoeing cycle, I think he grew almost an inch more foot on that side than the other. It was a hind foot. And the fairy just couldn't believe his eyes when he looked at the two feet. I mean, they were so different. And the horse, you know, just had, had increased blood flow and, and awesome hoof growth on that, to, which helped get him over that injury really quickly. Yeah, it's like the hoof's response to inflammation or yeah. the healing, I guess. Yep. Yeah. So I forgot to say that there's kind of a... I don't know where this fits into some cross between hoof wall evulsions and a laceration, but coronary band lacerations can be really interesting. So coronary band lacerations, <laughs> you can actually suture them to some degree, which, you know, a true hoof wall evulsion, there's really not a lot you can do. I mean, people have sort of stapled hoof walls back on, but it really doesn't work very well. Typically you just remove the loose hoof wall and go about, you know, dealing with what's left. But a coronary band laceration, you certainly can repair. Those often also benefit from a hoof cast just to mobilize the area really temporarily, you know, even just two weeks of a hoof cast. It's not like forever, um, just to get it stabilized enough to knit together. Um, And then you can end up having some interesting problems. I had one draft horse that had a laceration to the the top dorsal coronary band and ended up growing sort of like a unicorn like projection of hoof wall like just that grew like straight upwards from there because a few little you know hoof growing cells from the periobal there had been displaced and then it ended up growing hoof straight upwards which was obviously problematic because it was sensitive and it got you know ripped off and cut so in those cases you can sometimes remove that so i was able to block the foot and just remove that area of abnormal horn growth that that was obviously not not helpful and i've seen the same thing happen at the heels as well you can get kind of just like a hangnail type of hoof growth growing off and in some cases if it's not um, catching on things you can just have your farrier you know or trim it yourself just keep it trimmed so it's not sticking out or sticking down and that's just an interesting sort of subset is is coronary band lacerations can can kind of cause trouble down the line sometimes you don't really know looking at them if you're going to end up having one of those issues but certainly that's something their vet you know would pay attention to right away and and it has a good prognosis but with some interesting side (laughs) side sequela to it i don't think i've ever seen that i mean i've probably seen like coronary band nicks like what even with the rasp where you hit it and it bleeds but I don't think I've seen a true laceration, probably. Something that isn't really a hoof injury, but definitely can require vet attention is laminitis. And Sarah and I could have talked for hours about laminitis. So we kind of do a general overview, but if this is something you're interested in, then you can check out past episodes of the podcast with Dr. Taylor, Dr. Van Epps, Dr. Kluwer, and more about causes of laminitis, various approaches to treatment, and more. Yeah, and I guess, so another thing that I wanted to touch upon, or probably the last topic in terms of, you know, vet involvement in hoof lameness, is laminitis. Mostly because it's something that I see so much year round this year because of the rain or 
you know, whatever we've had with the grass growing or, you know, horses that have had issues in the past are really struggling. So it, can you touch upon maybe some of the first signs that owners should look for if they're worried about laminitis and when the vet should be called? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, so we can break laminitis for this purpose into like two general categories. One being, you know, sort of metabolic laminitis that's probably been under the radar, but then comes to the surface for one reason or another, grass, you know, whole bag of carrots, who knows why. And then, you know, laminitis that's due to some sort of sepsis or something. So if you have, let's start with the, the second one, because that's sort of more clear cut in my mind. So um, if you have a horse, let's say you're unlucky and he gets really bad diarrhea or colitis, um, your horse is, you know, pooping liquid and that makes the horse sick enough to induce laminitis. And that's absolutely something that, you know, if your vet wasn't already involved for the diarrhea, they should be involved um, for the laminitis. And, and those are cases where, you know, time and time again, the, the value of cold therapy is really, really the only, only great weapon we have against that is ice. So I know most of the referral hospitals around here will take horses like just to put them in ice. You know, they'll have a special stall or a set of stocks and they will put your horse feet in ice. You know, sometimes just the front, sometimes all four because getting really round the clock ice is just so hard to achieve in the barn. There are a number of new hoof boots that you can use to ice the horse's feet, you know, that, that work to varying degrees of okay but um nothing is really comparable to like a deep bucket of ice water that is certainly the gold standard or a deep ice boot that's constantly replenished with ice water um and that you know i think you guys are probably familiar with the research out of australia where it's it's shown you know very clearly that that does stop the progression of laminitis in these cases and that's and like I said, one of the only weapons that we have in the first acute stages. So I would say definitely your vet should be involved in a case like that where the horse is either sick, let's say fever, colitis, grain overload, something like that that has, or sometimes you don't know as well. Sometimes you don't know what, what category you're in. And, and in that case, I would say, yeah, involve the vet. The really frustrating ones for me are the ones that are metabolic and they're so sneaky. They sneak up on you. The horse is like, mm, is she a little off? Is she a little stiff? You know, like she's just not moving the way she did. And you know what? Darn it. Her crest is a little big. And like those are the ones that, that I find, you know, they don't necessarily cause an emergency call. But I think those are ones I, I often find myself wishing I'd been called about a month or, you know, <laughs> two weeks at least um, earlier in the process because, you know, it fools us too. It fools horse owners. I'm certainly, you know, I'm not immune. I've been caught out thinking that a horse is just foot sore or something like that when really they were starting to founder and, and, you know, we missed the boat on it. So that's something where ice therapy in my hands has been less helpful um, because I think the changes have just been going on for so much longer and we just don't really appreciate it. Um, so those are the cases where the vet's role there I think can be very helpful with some blood work. So you know insulin levels I've just I find myself testing so many more horses for high insulin than I ever used to and the results can just be you know astounding like there's little ponies that are barely lame and their insulin is like sitting at eight or nine hundred you know and you're just like well, I guess we know what the problem is now. Um, and there's more that you can do about that. You know, if you call sooner before the horse is like lying down all the time and truly laminitic, you know, making those diet changes and or lifestyle changes or whatever they need to be for your metabolic horse sooner rather than later. And I haven't actually, I don't think it's available yet, but there's apparently like a stall side insulin meter coming out that's going to be available. That's you know might be a game changer but you know I think overall just catching these horses earlier would be so great so you know I'm not I'm not advocating that you call on an emergency basis but you know if you're noticing those changes in your horse's gait maybe your farrier says something maybe you're battling white line it's just not getting better you know ask for metabolic testing you know an insulin and an ACTH can go a long way to like guiding your decision making and it's really not that expensive so I would say intervention in that sense you know as long as you know what you're asking for can be very helpful yeah I can just if you don't mind taking a little detour into insulin um, you know there's some really great research and again this has just been in the last 10 years and so I think it's taking some time to sort of percolate into our consciousness but 
um, insulin being a direct cause of laminitis has been really well shown now. So there's a group of ponies and they were administered insulin through an IV catheter. And obviously when you do that, you also have to administer some glucose so the pony doesn't pass out from hypoglycemia. But when extra insulin is administered to a healthy pony, non-laminitic healthy pony, every pony that in the study developed laminitis within 48 hours of having excess insulin. So it's it's pretty clear, and I think we are narrowing down potentially that it's, you know, insulin is binding to insulin like growth factor in the foot, which then causes the elongation of the lamina and then basically a mechanical failure of the, you know, attachment of the hoof wall to the coffin bone. But it's pretty conclusive that, that insulin is, you know, a critical, if not the critical player here. So, you know, and it's something we can test. So, if you think that your horse might be foundering and you think it might be a metabolic issue, I would urge you to test that, you know, in addition to ACTH and ACTH is obviously for Cushing's, not for insulin resistance. Um, but it's really the most common test I think that, that vets are, are reaching for is the ACTH and that has its own issues, but tack on the insulin, you know, don't hesitate because a high insulin, you know, it can, can really be that piece of evidence that helps you get motivated to modify your diet or modify your horse's exercise or, or however you, you need to manage it. Um, but knowing that piece of information I think can be very helpful. Yeah. And as a total side note, because I was thinking of it as you were talking. So do you think with horses that have PPID, do you think that their ACTH levels play a role in like driving up insulin and causing laminitis? Or is there another reason that PPID horses get laminitis? Yeah, that's a good question too. Um, first of all, I'd like to say that, you know, Cushing's disease or PPID and insulin resistance I like to think of them as two separate problems, really. I think it's simpler that way. So they can certainly exist independently of each other, but it does seem like they overlap. The two conditions overlap in a very large number of horses. And it looks like that relationship can happen two ways. One, um, I do think that having PPID will um, be a driver of insulin resistance. So, you know, whether that's a, it, it certainly has a hormonal basis. Um, you know, the, the rhythm of cortisol secretion, for example, can be altered, um, as well as a number of other hormones that help control their metabolic rate. Um, so it certainly seems like PPID can, can certainly be a contributing factor to insulin resistance. And the reverse can also be true. Um, you know, horses with insulin resistance, breeds that are prone to insulin resistance, like the Morgans, it does seem like those horses are getting PPID at younger ages um, than other breeds and, and other, you know, types of horses that are less prone to insulin resistance. So it certainly seems like they can influence each other um, in both ways. Um, but again, you know, just to circle back, I do like to kind of think of them and test for them as separate conditions and address them as such. Um, you know, PPID primarily we treat through medication um, and insulin resistance is, is primarily treated through diet, exercise um, type of regimens and, and management issues. So they certainly, like I said, can exist independent of each other, but so many horses have both um, that it, it does bear in mind that we need to consider all aspects of it. Yeah, definitely. And a few friends and I have talked a lot about how when I was a kid growing up riding, I never remember, unless I just wasn't aware, I never remember this many horses having laminated issues or metabolic issues. And either it's just we're more aware now or, you know, know more about it now, or there's some other environmental factors or dietary factors that are causing more horses to become metabolic. Or I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I can only offer speculation, really. I do know that, you know, where I did my internship down in Georgia, and the um, one of my mentors there was pretty convinced that, you know, the way that they had improved pasture grass in efforts to fatten beef cattle better and quicker had been very detrimental to horses. So she was sure that, you know, a combination of what grasses were growing and the type of improved grasses, um, plus, you know, depending on soil and weather conditions, um, were, were a huge problem in that part of the world. You know, and we don't graze a lot of beef cattle here, but we certainly, you know, spread pasture mix when we have a pasture. And and even the, the hay crops, you know, often are getting fertilized and, and they're, they're seeding different hays and stuff like that to get better yields. So, you know, it's not so much the, just the marginal orchard grass that like I grew up, you know, feeding my horses. It's often like pretty rich, even Timothy, like, you know, we often think of Timothy as like, oh, it's just Timothy, it's fine. But even some, you know, well 
self-fertilized improved Timothy that's like cut at the right time can be, I think, sugarier than we think, than we think. Yeah, and I think I just really had one more question. Um, do you think that there are any, and you might have already kind of answered this, but do you think there are any instances of lameness that you wouldn't feel the need to, you know, have the owner talk to the vet, or do you always want to hear from the owner if the horse is having a soundness issue? Boy, um, that's a great question. I would say, you know, it just depends on the owner. There are certainly horses that abscess like clockwork, and I don't need to know about every every time that happens. I mean, if, if this is something that's happened to your horse before and you feel comfortable dealing with it and there's none of those, you know, risk factors, I would say just, you know, careful observation. Pick up the foot. Make sure there's not a stick in the frog or something like that. You know, and then if it's something you've dealt with before, you don't have to call. I'm not, I'm not advocating that, you know, certainly that we get called every time the horse takes an off step. Um, there's a lot you can deal with, bruising and abscessing being the main two. And even mild laminitis. I mean, you don't have to call till the next day. If you think your horse is laminitic, you know, like put him in some deep bedding and maybe put some ice packs on him and call in the morning. It's okay. <laughs> there's a lot you can deal with. And, um, yeah, I think... It just depends on the, the owner's level of comfort and, and whether or not the horse has sort of done this before as well. Yeah. Awesome. I think that's like the main bulk of what I was going to ask. So this is where Sarah and I end our episode. But if you have any more questions, I think the take home message is don't be scared to reach out and ask your vet. They'll probably be more than willing to answer your questions over text message or the phone without charging you a fee to come out and see the horse if it's not needed. I always say that I'm slightly more hoof obsessed than the average person, and chances are, if you're listening to a hoof care podcast, you are too, so we should probably be friends. Feel free to find me on Facebook or email me at thehumblehoof at gmail.com.